Hey, this is Man Made Mead. Quick thing about this video. This is a podcast I did with Steve from Canadian Sasquatch, and I normally put all of my podcasts on the Man Made Mead Extras channel. So if you want to see them um, regularly, go subscribe to that. I'm exclusively putting this one onto this channel, and I hope you will go join me over on the Man Made Mead Extras channel. So hope I hope you enjoy the podcast, and thanks for watching. Yeah, this is episode 16 of, of um, What's New with Mead, is what I call it. So okay. it's where I just talk about mead making. A lot of the time it's uh, what's happened in my own brew world, but mm -hmm. also um, just talking about mead making in general. So I'm, I'm here with Steve um, from Canadian Sasquatch. Who, um, he is another YouTube mead maker, and I know that you haven't been as active recently, but um, at one point right. you were... You're posting at least once a week, right? <clears throat> yeah, there was a little bit there. I was trying to do once a week, maybe twice a week, depending on what was going on. Uh, kind of around the same time I was trying to uh, advertise my book that I just written. Yeah. Just kind of use the YouTube to push that. So I was trying to do be a lot more active. So I, was I would love to there for all that. Yeah. So what, what's your book title? uh mead methodologies so is it um is it in your book are you mainly talking about the basics of mead making <clears throat> are you diving into the in-depth things or so it's for me one of the hardest things when with making mead was trying to find how to just go through and make mead using the various like calculations and all that for the san and yan and all that stuff and there was like no good one place for a lot of that so mm -hmm. i was like so i took my uh, youtube series mead methodologies um which used to be a different name but i got cease and desist um <laughs> jeez <laughs> so yeah. so i i no longer say that name but yeah. if you look hard enough you'll see what it was um so i came up with that YouTube series about eight or nine weeks worth, one one a week. And the theory behind that was in episode one, we would go over what the series was about and start making a batch of Joe's Ancient Orange because that mm -hmm. takes eight weeks. Mm -hmm. So if you follow along, uh, each week we talk about that particular subject and do whatever maintenance on Joe's. And on week nine, I was doing Q and A and drinking the batch of mead that we had made from the first, yeah. first week. That's awesome. So uh, when you so started I that series, took did that you? Con yeah, oh, go ahead. So I took that series and turned it into a book. Essentially each week is its own chapter in the okay. book. Yeah. That's a, so, so how many chapters in total are there? Oh, uh, I think there's now 10 chapters. Sweet. Where can we um, find your book for yeah. anyone interested? Amazon. Amazon. Awesome. Uh, it is, uh, you can buy it as an ebook. Uh, it's, I think it's $5.99 as an ebook. Um, or you can buy a print copy and it's print on demand from Amazon. So you can only get it through Amazon. And it costs way too much for what it is for a print book. <laughs> well, I'll make sure I put it down in my description uh, of this for anybody interested. But I definitely, yeah. um, you know, I, I, what year did you write that? Was it? Um, so I did the YouTube series was 2016. And I think the book came out in 2018. Okay. Yeah. So, so you've probably yeah. read through um you know the the mead making bible or at least seen it you know the one that we all tote um the kinch rams book Ken's, yeah. yeah yep i ha i have a lot of those books sitting behind me right now yeah. actually and they're they're great i don't want to i'm not knocking those <clears throat> at all um i definitely i want to yeah. plug people to go to yours because i don't think there's any way to get too much mead information um 
Oh no, that's that's why I have a stack of them. And I kind of took a little bit of information from all those and I tried to like distill it down to a whole lot less fluff. And here's here's what you need to know. Just go do it. Yeah. So if so, you were uh, advising a beginning mead maker brewer in general, what are some um <clears throat> What are like the, I would say, maybe like the three, just a few most important things to know before you start your first mead? Because I know that we can complicate it. We can also make it in some ways too simple. Yeah. Um, what, what, do, what do you think the most important things to know before you start making mead? There is a lot of dishes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the number one thing. And that's also one of the reasons why I kind of back off from doing so much of it is I don't like doing dishes. Um, uh -huh. But other than that, it's the, the only real thing that I, comes to mind with it is do it to have fun. Um, use your culinary skills. We all have them to some degree to come up with the flavors that you like. And with that, work backwards from that to come up with a recipe with whatever you want to do it. If it's using the various uh, the uh, nutrients and all that, or just go straight natural with no extra nutrients or what have you. It's like, you can make it super simple. You can make it super complicated. Um, me personally, I'm pretty lazy. So I just do the, all the math up front and say, okay, on these days I'm doing this rather than doing it the correct way and taking measurements and adding the nutrients or whatever at the specific time. So, yeah. So just, where do you fall? Where do you fall in that regard with, with yeast nutrient? Are you, are you more often than not using yeast nutrient when you brew or are you trying to go more natural? Um, for the most part, I use nutrients. Um, the, last mead that I was going to make was actually just going to be like an organic, like for Mado, nothing but for Mado and that. Um, but unfortunately I didn't just didn't get a chance to do the job and life and stuff getting in the way at that particular time. Um, but, but yeah, I am, a, it, the nutrients do make a difference in a lot of them. Um, that said, I have made some where I took honey and I added water and I let it sit and that's it. And that actually turned out to be one of the best meads I ever made. Oh, so like wild yeast? You didn't even add any yeast or yeah. anything? It was honey that I helped a friend harvest out of his hive and uh -huh. I just added water to it. And then yeah. I actually saved the yeast from that and I made a grit out of it. Yeah, yeah. So. I've only done a, a wild yeast mead one time and I did a video over it, but I couldn't get it to happen just from the honey. So I added organic raisins and the, okay. the yeast came from that. Yeah, I just let it sit for like a year and then it kind of oh, wow. kind of started doing something. I was like, I was it was just an experiment and it was like I was yeah. in no rush one way or the other. And yeah, it it actually turned out to be one of the best flavored traditional meads that I had ever done. Was it pretty low ABV or were you getting it up to, you know, decent strength? If you remember. Um, I don't know. Cause I don't usually do that math either. Okay. So, yeah. and there, there is a way to figure it. Yeah. And there's a way to figure it out after the fact where you like boil some down and do that math, but there was so little of it. Cause I only made one gallon batch and you quite often need like eight ounces to figure out the ABV after the fact. And I was like, yeah, this tastes too good for that. Yeah. <laughs> but I would assume it's somewhere between eight and 12%. Okay. Interesting. So, I wondered, yeah, I feel like my problem with that wild yeast meat I made was that um, the wild yeast of course are wild. So you don't really have an exact knowledge yeah, no idea of how high. Gonna, yeah. You have no idea what it's going to do. Yeah. So it's like, you don't know if it's going to, if they're going to burn through that 12% or if they're going to stop at mm -hmm. seven. And so, um, but at least with the, what I did, mine ended at 10 and it was, it was fantastic. So, yeah. So with the grit that I made, so that it was actually a braggot grit mm -hmm. and that got up to eight or 9% easy. 
and that was all the sugars that was in it. So it fermented it fairly dry. Yeah. It's wild yeast are definitely powerful. I think that's something that we yeah. can remember. Um, yeah, are you a fan definitely. of using bread yeast? Yeah. Uh, ancient, ancient jo Joe's ancient orange. Yeah. That's, uh, uh, so I started making mead in 2012 and for a good part of that, I was making at least one batch of that every year. Cause that's mm -hmm. my wife and my essentially favorite mead. Yeah. No, I, so I did a test on my YouTube channel of a Joe's mm -hmm. ancient orange with bread yeast versus wine yeast. Uh -huh. And I think at the end of the whole thing, bread yeast ended up winning in my opinion, which I thought oh, was yeah. pretty interesting. Well, for that recipe, it was designed for bread yeast. So mm -hmm. you also have to take that into effect because each yeast has its own characteristics as um, different flavors, di different esters, all that stuff as it comes out and ferments. So, so do you have a favorite um, yeast aside from using bread yeast? Is there one that you would go to pretty commonly? Um, I use... A couple different ones. I use uh, most of it is Lablins. Uh, for the bigger stuff, and if I'm fermenting a little bit warm, it's going to be the 1116. Um, mm -hmm. That one does quite well in the warmth down here in Texas. Um, and then uh, I'm drawing a blank on the other ones 71B. Yeah, there's another one. I use that one quite a bit. And then RC212. Okay, yeah. I've only had one experience with that one, and it was pretty good. Yeah. And that one does really well with citrus, I find. So I Did you – I know this one's really – it's really uh, in-depth, and you're having to probably recall knowledge. But do you remember on that one, the RC – is it a slow fermenter for you? Do you recall? Sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, I had one where it took a while, but then I've also had it where it like just burned through everything. So I don't know if it's like a nutrient. I know it really wants a lot of nutrients. So I don't know if at the time it was really slow, it just didn't have enough or if there was a temperature thing or because the first time I used it, I didn't have proper temperature control really. <clears throat> um, but after that, yeah, a lot of nutrients and good temperatures and yeah, could burn through a thing in a week. Yeah. So I do on my channel, I do a thing called the yeast shootout series where I mm -hmm. take two yeasts and I just give them the same recipe. And then of course, put the different yeasts in and I decide yep. which one I like more. And I actually put that one up the bat with, uh, Oh goodness. I can't even remember now. I've done so many of them anyways, but that one, what I thought was interesting about it was that it, it, it toted that it not only, was like um, a pretty decent fast fermenter, low flocculation, but also retained uh, color really well. And that was one I haven't seen very often about <clears throat> the yeast. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why I went with that one because I've been trying to make like the perfect blood orange mead, mm -hmm. but it always loses the color. Like the flavor is pretty good, but it always loses the color and it turns golden or just not that nice vibrant red that blood oranges have mm -hmm. so that was one of the things and that's actually what the last mead that i was going to make was a blood orange one and i was actually going to use a tinned puree of the blood oranges so yeah so when you're was, making a, a fruit mead uh, this kind of sorry to divert a little bit yeah obviously there's the debate of should I put my fruit in this primary versus the secondary in your experience? What have you found is more effective or what do you prefer when adding fruit? Depend, depends on the flavor profile. Um, so if you put it in primary, you usually get more jammy flavors because it gets a little bit more cooked like you do with jams. If you put it in secondary, then you get more of that fresh fruit flavor. So it really depends on what flavor profile you want and when you put it into whether it's primary, secondary, tertiary or anything like that. Yeah. So that makes sense. I have, I more often than not will put mine in the secondary to try and mm -hmm. I feel like that primary just blows off so many 
uh, aromas that you lose a lot of or some flavor from fruit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it's a little bit of that, but it's you also get that more cooked flavor. So which also kind of uh, lessens the flavor as well, because if you like take a bunch of berries and you just eat those, they've got all that super berry flavor. But if you get that same berryness in a jam, then it's kind of muted because it's been boiled out. As you say, the aromas and flavors get boiled out and it's to add so much sugar and stuff that it's yeah jammy yeah interesting did you um have you ever experimented with stabilizing before you added fruit have you ever done that before uh no so i've been i've been doing that some recently i have a recipe i really mm -hmm. like to do it's like an apple cinnamon and i've found yeah. that i'll start with you know the sizer base of using apple juice and, and mm -hmm. honey and all that but then i'll pile a decent amount of apples in the secondary after I um, stabilize. And I normally get this even more sweet rounded apple character. I haven't done it with it with many mm -hmm. other fruits, but I'm, I'm wondering if uh, even in the secondary fermentation, obviously there's some fermentation that happens. That's why it's called secondary fermentation. But yeah. if um, stabilizing pre putting those fruits in, almost guarantees that you're going to get the flavor you want. That seems something yeah. like I'd have to run a test with it. Yeah. To, to some point that that would happen. Um, <clears throat> Cause at that point you're not, you now are using alcohol to pull out the flavors. So that as well will change the flavor profile of the fruit as well. So yeah, there it's, it's different between all three of them which flavors you'll actually end up with. Yeah. So you're on the quest to make the best blood orange mead. Are you using, um, uh, you're probably using real blood oranges and pre are you pureeing them yourself, yourself or buying like the store-bought purees? So the first two batches I did were, I went to the store, I picked out the blood oranges. I, Juice them, I slice them up, I toss them in, I saved some of the zest because I used the zest in secondary, used the juice in primary. <clears throat> um, I tried more juice in secondary after the fact. Um, I just, they've all tasted good. They've all had things that could be improved on. One of the main things that I really want to pull out is that color. Um, this last time when I was going to do it, I was actually going to, I actually was going to get uh, tins of puree from like Vinter's Harvest or whatever and use those and also use some of the other uh, big winery tricks for keeping color like Opti Red and some of those other nutrients that you can buy that supposed to help retain color as well, feed the yeast. So Interesting. I don't know much about work. that side. Yeah. Yeah, it was going to be my first real test on playing with those particular nutrients or adjuncts or whatever you want to call them, where they're specifically there for trying to retain color. Yeah. So, are you um, are you normally letting your meads age? via lots of time to clear or are you a kind of person that wants to throw in some sparkloid easy clear do a fine anything like that depends on the mead i kind of like i mentioned i'm lazy so i usually just let them sit there and mm -hmm. if they've been sat there for a year and they're still cloudy at, at that point i will toss in uh sparkloid usually for meads mm -hmm. For beer, I actually use gelatin. Oh yeah. Okay. So yeah, it's funny. I'm yeah, behind me. I'm with... running a test with that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. The, the the problem with gelatin is it actually pulls out flavor as well. So you got to build bigger flavored, and if you plan on using the gelatin, because that's what I've noticed out. with I've noticed that with bentonite. I don't know if you've ever used that before, mm -hmm. but that's it... similar to sparkloid. Yeah, I think 
um, obviously I, some people will, a lot of people put it in the primary or before the primary to mm -hmm. like preemptively make it clear. So to speak. Yeah, that's what a but, lot of the wine kits do. Mm -hmm. And I've been experimenting some with putting it of course afterwards. Um, mm -hmm. And it does pull a lot of those flavors out, which I found yeah. to be interesting. Yep. So mm -hmm. where in the ski in the world of clarity, do you think, um, are you, and there's no wrong answer, of course. Are you of the mindset that clarity, like a meat has to be clear to be good? Or are you like, if it's unclear, I'm fine. You know what I mean? I'm okay with a hazy mead. Yeah. <clears throat> um, again, it depend. It really depends on it. Uh, some of the uh, non-traditional meads, uh, they're just going to naturally be hazy because of the extra stuff that's in them. Uh, like if you make a hopped bead or whatever, that's they're going to be a little hazy because of the hop residue in them. Um, but it, something like a traditional should be pretty clear because there's nothing in there. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, <clears throat> so, I think some people are really like, if a meat is hazy, they're like, oh man, like get that away from me. That thing, yeah, <laughs> it must not be very good. <laughs> and then on the flip side, they'll drink a hazy IPA, no problem. <laughs> exactly exactly I'm like come on so what's your um not i don't want you to feel like you have to give away any recipes but what what's your brew house like standard what's one thing that you you feel like at this point in your brewing career you just love to brew or you feel most comfortable brewing Joe's. yeah 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 <laughs> joe's ancient orange that's that's pretty much the only one that i Outside of the blood orange, that's the only one I've ever made more than once. Yeah. So that, that that one I've probably made at least a dozen times. <clears throat> the blood orange I've done twice, and then I'm always changing the recipe on that. So it's it's different each time. But outside of that, it's like I haven't made the same thing twice. With the Joes, are you putting the full like four and a quarter pound of honey in to the gallon? Yes. I follow the recipe to a T. Yeah. So, um, with your experience in doing it, have you changed anything about it or do you keep it standard? I follow the standard recipe. Uh, we did, <clears throat> we did make a hybrid. So we did a Joe's ancient orange bomb. So braise one month mead. Mm -hmm. So we kind of combined those two recipes together, but instead of like cinnamon, we use star anise. So th okay. this, this was an idea that my wife came up with and I was like, all right, this sounds good. And, and yeah, it actually turned out really well since the, the bomb and Joe's both take similar amount of time, uh, kind of follow the Joe's recipe with braise, uh, nutrient and yeast combine the two use star anise instead of the cinnamon and yeah everything turned out pretty good so, i actually have some star anise that i'm trying to figure out how to use at some point you just um, plop it in and what, what kind of character it, does it normally impart i honestly don't have any experience with it licorice oh so okay it, so it tastes like licorice so if you don't like licorice don't use it <laughs> <clears throat> but i grew up eating black licorice so it's like yes this is a very tasty thing yeah, 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 yeah. Interesting. Well, I have so, like I have, I have a packet of it from. It's like the Brewers Best. You know, they make it. Whatever. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to figure out where to use it. Um, I went and bought a bunch of different spices the other day at the brew shop, and so at this point, I'm just trying to figure out what to do. Is there any mead you made that is? Um, do you feel is is really off the wall in all of your time? Um, not so much any mead, but some of the beers I've made. Okay. What have you done? So, well, uh, so I guess could be also meat because braggots. I, I mm -hmm. like to make braggots because I like I like the hoppiness of beer, but I also like the mead character. So I combine the two. And typically my braggots are more mead heavy. So when I was doing it all grain, I'd use, <clears throat> like if I use 12 pounds of grain, I'd use 12 pounds of honey. So oh, okay, yeah. 
they're going to be like 12 between 12 and 15 percent abv huge yeah. flavors <laughs> that's a the bomb right there that's good yeah. um but the most off the wall one the, uh, my duck squatches braggot grit braggot <clears throat> so that was so there's a gentleman on youtube called sj poor who does he's kind of the inventor of homebrew wednesday if you've ever oh. seen that out there that was him so he puts on a challenge and one of the challenges was, was brew local so you had to have at least one ingredient in your beer that was local well I don't really do normal or standard. So I did the grit braggot. So instead of just one ingredient, I used yeast that I harvest from my friend's honey. I used honey from the farmer's market. I used cornmeal from a place just two towns south of me, uh, dandelion root, which was pulled out of my yard. Um, uh -huh. Uh, there was a couple other things. Um, um, so, yeah, that came about, and that was – some people described it as, like, a Belgian quad in flavor uh, or, like, a drunken fruit cake. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people – Sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> It, it was hard for me not to drink them all. It was it was really good. Um, some of the other herbals that I had in it, uh, uh, yarrow, ginseng, a uh, couple other things, um, made it so it seemed so the eight per, eight or nine percent that it was actually made it feel like about 14, 15 percent. Oh wow! Yeah. It was it was pretty potent, and there was a couple of comments on that. I was like, "There's no way this is eight percent." I'm like, "Yeah, I actually did the math on this one." Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so, but yeah, that would be the most off the wall one. It was called Doc Squatch's Health Tonic. That sounds <clears throat> and, fantastic, though. And everything that was in there actually had some kind of health benefit. So, on the label, I actually labeled like, "This will help you with heart." burn, heart pains, sleeping, insomnia, digestion uh -huh. issues, blah, blah, blah. That's awesome. So, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Man, see, I uh, when I first started brewing or mead making, I should say, um, I was like anything that took more than three ingredients or four ingredients, I was like, that's too many. But now <laughs> that I've <laughs> I just uh -huh. I, I've changed my mind a little bit and it's because of some of these recipes I've made. Like it started with the Joe's Ancient Orange that I did one mm -hmm. time and it, of course, has a bunch of ingredients yeah. came out really good. And now I've been, of course, experience or experimenting with a bunch of different recipes that have maybe seven or eight, nine things. And and uh, while, yes, you do have to purchase more ingredients, it pays mm -hmm. off in the end. Oh, yeah. And that kind of goes back to when we started this conversation is think of the flavor profile that you want to achieve and work backwards from that. It's like, okay, like going back to the Joe's bomb star is like, oh, we want a licorice thing. How do we achieve that? Star anise. Okay. So how do we use that? Oh, we could use, we want it done quickly. So let's use bomb. But we also know Joe's works, and we were like those flavors. So we just start combining stuff, and it just works out. Yeah. Do you have a favorite honey that you like to use at this point in all of your time? <clears throat> Wahia. So it's okay. a South Texas only uh, plant, and my <clears throat> local farmers market. Uh, there's a lady there who sells it by the gallon and. I visit her for by a lot. Interesting. It's so it does have a slight medicinal flavor to it to start with, but that works it way out. And you just work that into the flavor profiles as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's it's just a flavor profile that I quite enjoy. So well that's in interesting. Meats. It's interesting you said the medicinal flavor. And I'm thinking specifically of uh, I was tasting something the other day. And I had that same thought. I was like, this has a medicinal flavor. Mm -hmm. And to me, 
you know, we think of maybe like Robitussin or something like you, you grew up like the terrible medicine right. you hated trying or having to take as maybe medicinal. Yeah. I also equate some medicinal value to like a chalky. I don't Nothing have like more. an exact like fruit. Yeah. Like some, yeah. I don't have a, like a, a, it's weird to explain the flavor. Do you have any explanation yeah. for what you mean by chalk or not chalky by medicinal? So with the Wahia medicinal, uh, take a whiff of Vicks Vapor Rub, and you get that oh, okay. that kind of yeah. medicinal um, aroma, and that's very very mellowed down, but it's similar to that um, kind of mint like mm -hmm. type flavors and stuff like that can be very medicinal. Yeah, I can see that. Okay. <clears throat> so Yeah. Um interesting. Or there's the other medicinal like cough syrup, which I did a cherry vanilla cough syrup mead once. I was gonna say that yeah, a lot of times <clears throat> cherry, anybody everybody who makes a cherry mead, some people love it or some people go, This tastes like cough syrup. <laughs> so it's like there's no yeah, really depends. in between. Yeah, it, it all depends on the cherries that you do it with. If you use sweet cherries, you're going to end up with cough syrup. Mm -hmm. You have to use the tart cherries yeah. to get a cherry-flavored something that tastes good. The only way I've figured how to combat the sweet cherry, that what you're saying, that uh, mm -hmm. medicine taste, is actually pairing it with like, a contrasting flavor of maybe like chocolate or something mm -hmm. that just quote distracts you <laughs> from that taste. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So, I did a ch chocolate cherry beer that turned out very well. It wasn't medicinal at all. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. cherry alone is definitely a, one of those flavors that. Yeah. And when I combined it with um, vanilla and a very sweet mead, it was very cough syrup. They even yeah. kind of had like that coating, like cough syrup does. Uh -huh. So it was, <clears throat> it was a mouthfeel kind of. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it just kind of coats your mouth, like. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's so. I, I I asked that question about kind of weird flavors because I um one thing I've been doing with my YouTube channel, I started a new series called "Can It Be a Mead," where I essentially I spend two different wheels. And one has a bunch of fruits on it. And then one has a bunch of weird flavors, peppers, um, okay. cinnamon. Uh, what else is on that? I'm trying to think. A bunch of weird like spices, essentially. Right. And um, <clears throat> I've been challenging myself to make those. So like right now, I'm actually drinking. This is uh, it's something that's going to go out on Monday. But it's a, a uh, watermelon, jalapeno, and cinnamon mead. That I that I spun and landed on those flavors. Okay. And so it's, I, I have it's done fun. a atomic fireball candy mead mm. with ghost chili. Oh <laughs> man! And, and the the fun part about this is the atomic fireball mead by itself. I drain poured that, but one but the part that I added ghost chilies to. That turned out really well. You can only drink about an ounce of it because it pulled out the capsaicin as well. Yeah. <laughs> so it burns, but it tastes good. Yeah. No, that's definitely that, that that's awesome though. I, I find those to be fascinating. I know that some people are like any some people think that if you're adding anything but honey water yeast or normal fruits, that you're making some mm -hmm. you're making a sin essentially. <laughs> Yeah. So a couple of years ago, I was doing, I created the Canadian Sasquatch Mead Challenge. <clears throat> and I created that because I wanted to basically find a way to be able to model share with people around the world. So I was like, let's make it into a challenge and see what everybody can do. And so I actually got three years out of that, was working on my fourth year, but due to 2018 life and stuff, that didn't come through. And I'm hoping maybe next year to get back into it. But the whole point of it was to check it was the canadian sasquatch challenge and it was to challenge ourselves to make different meads and stuff so like the first one was the first year it was traditional and so i had people from new zealand and the u.s and wales all 
do it all with different honeys. I used a honey from cranberries and you could mm -hmm. actually get the cranberry flavor from it. Um, the second one was you had to use chocolate. So I'm actually huh. drinking right now a bochette that I had made for that. So it was a chocolate bochette mead and I turned used the honey was a wildflower honey that already had a caramel flavor to it. Uh -huh. And as soon as I tasted that honey, I was like, this has to be a bochette. So I boiled it down, turned it into a bochette, chocolate bochette meat. The last one that I did was it had to be a mellow mel. And I just threw it out there. Any plant will be a mellow mel at this point. Just mm -hmm. because it was such a small group. It's like between five and eight of us. I think I remember you were, you talking about this though, like yeah. a few years ago. <clears throat> yeah. And so for that, I did grilled pineapple. Mm -hmm. So I used mesquite honey and I actually cut pineapple, grilled it on my grill and tossed that into secondary. And we had grilled pineapple and you can actually get the caramelized pineapple flavors through it. That sounds fantastic. So yeah. yeah. It, I think I remember you um, you talking about that and doing the the fourth year because I was following and I was uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to be a part of it and honestly yeah. I was like that's where I was right when I was starting I started mainly it was what is midway closer ish to the end of 2017 and yeah. so um, that's about I know you you're in the heat of doing those things at that point yeah. and so the the fourth year challenge was going to be a, a hydro mill. So mm -hmm. anything below 8%. So, and the other part of the challenge was you had two months to do it. Usually all the other ones, you have one year to do it from whenever I now <clears throat> announced it. But this one, it was two months because it was a hydro mill. So it wouldn't take that long. So that was, that was supposed to be the challenge. And I, I think uh, do that one again. That's funny. So it's funny you mentioned that because I I've tried one quote official hydromel, like an, a true attempt at a hydromel on my channel, and I think it was inspired by by your challenge. I had done one that was um, uh, with strawberry, and okay. I had in, in hindsight, I'm seeing now that it might not have been a fungus or something that had grown, but rather it was something that the strawberries naturally create. Mm -hmm. It was like some white kind of weird foam that looked like a a mold of some sort. Yeah. But at the time I was like, this looks like mold. My meat is dead. Mm -hmm. All right. I guess I'm out. <laughs> it's, I did that. Uh, so I had a similar situation. I did a blackberry mead and I called it uh, back breaking uh, blackberry mead. Mm -hmm. Cause I went out and I, my wife and I, we harvest, 25 pounds of blackberries. Goodness. And went through the process of creating the mead, fermenting it, um, and all that. And then it came time to uh, bottle it, and I went to lift the carboy up and threw my back out. Oh, no. <laughs> so it was literally backbreaking at that oh, point. Oh, geez. <clears throat> yeah. But I noticed that there was like the white fungus, whatever, uh -huh. grown on top. Um, <clears throat> I just went in and I scooped that off and, uh -huh. <clears throat> excuse me, switch to this one here. <laughs> <clears throat> so, yeah, I went in and I scooped all that stuff off and let it continue its thing. And <clears throat> I actually got to, when I went to, bottle it um i i rarely take measurements before and after for figuring out the abv i always if it's a big batch then i'll just do a test at the end where you just <clears throat> boil some down and you can figure out the gravity from that um and the my first attempt at that and it was like three and a half percent i'm like okay okay i screwed something up here <clears throat> so i went through and i did the process again. I was like, no, it's three and a half percent. I'm like, why is it three and a half percent? Come into my office here and I'm 
like just trying to think about it. And yeah, in the corner of my office was the rest of the honey that I forgot to put in. <laughs> so, so it's like blackberry water. That's at that, that point. Yeah, you know, uh, a weak blackberry uh, wine. <laughs> Uh, there, there was a little bit of honey in there because I remember it's like, okay, I need all this plus this like quart of honey. Yeah, and I remember that quart of honey, but I forgot the the big jug of it. It was like, uh, all right, and it's like, okay, well, it's not to my palate this particular blackberry thing, but I pawn it off on other people and like, and they're like, oh my god, this is so good. So I just yeah. give them bottles, and they're like, yeah. yes. It's like if you like it, more power to you. It's That's not great. something I enjoy. Yeah, I do that. I mean, I I make a lot of stuff, and um, some of it turns out great. Some of it's like oh, it's it's okay. But yeah. at this point, um, I guess my question to you would be: Do you did you bottle everything you made, or um, you know, were you were you just handing out bottles as you just made masses amounts of mead? Because that's kind of where I'm at. <clears throat> um. I handed out some. I drank some. There's mm-hmm. still a lot around. Um, like I actually stumbled across a bottle of the first meat I ever put together. Oh man, uh, like, that's got to yeah, be a video for that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, so there's that. It's actually the first, the first one and the fifth one that uh, I found bottles of those. And it's interesting because the fifth meat I made was actually the first one I bottled. And the first meat I made was the fifth one I bottled. Interesting. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Because so the first meat I made was it was a kit from the local homebrew store. And yeah, it just didn't taste good, didn't taste good, didn't taste good. So I just kind of left in the carboy. And it was, yeah, you know, like a year or so later, my taste was like, oh, wow, this is really good. So I bottled it. At that point, it was like the fifth one mm-hmm. that I had bottled. So meanwhile, the fifth one that I had bottled was turned out to be is like it. It was probably a not uh, Joe's Ancient Orange, but another like four to six week quick feed just to tr- see if like what that's all about and yeah Mm -hmm. that actually turned around real fast so i think that's uh, that's one thing i want to impart and part to people is like while mead is not beer in that you can drink it generally in four or five weeks and it be at its best like a beer Mm -hmm. i mean it does get better over time ish some of them normally by like six to eight weeks it's like it's where it's gonna be yeah (laughs) um so meads do get better over time, but that's not to say that you have to wait a year to two years to make your mead, to drink your mead in order for it to be good. Yes, yeah. some of them do. Like you said, your first one, you know, took a year yeah. to turn around. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I've had some um, sitting carboys. The thing with mead making is they always say, if it doesn't taste good, wait a year. It doesn't taste good. Wait a year because they do get better. I've had some that four years later I drain poured because they did not get better for because yeah. of various off flavors or whatever that just wouldn't age out. Um, but things like Joe's Ancient Orange, you you can drink that right out of the carboy, and that's sometimes yeah. what we do. Like you make the one gallon, the actual one gallon thing of it, and you just. Pour that straight you pour it straight out. Yeah. Yeah. It's like I got to a point where I was making like five and six gallon batches of that because we were drinking that so much. But but on the flip side, um, I have a bottle. I actually just saw that today that I have a bottle from 2013 of that. So and that's that's awesome. So yeah. It's like most most of the stuff I have is actually pretty old because I haven't brewed since 2017. Mm-hmm. And well, so it's, at some point, I'm still going to send you a bottle, a couple bottles. I need to send you a care package. Actually, you know, I don't know where you're at in Texas, but I lived in Texas for a small stint in my life. And mm-hmm. uh, had I known then, I would have just, it probably would have been easier to get it to you <laughs> at that point. Where, 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 where in Texas were you? Uh, I was up at the Panhandle, so I was probably okay. still far away from you. But yeah, um, I'm, in, I'm in Houston. 
yeah. Well, you're closer than you are. I'm in Oklahoma City now, so um, okay. it's not too far away, but enough yeah. to where I still got to ship something out. So, uh, yeah, I'd love yeah, to send still, you some stuff. Still probably closer than the Panhandle. Yeah. <laughs> Panhandle is like, there's nothing. It's just an extension of Oklahoma, essentially. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I, so is there anything you, in your brewing time, that you wish – or you still want to brew? Is there a recipe that you're like, I am, I'm waiting for the day that I can do this one. Not to say we're going to steal it. I'm just curious, picking your brain. Um, just going back to the blood orange. Mm -hmm. Cause I definitely want to like get that one nailed down. Cause you know, blood oranges are pretty much my favorite fruit. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so if I could capture that in a mead, that'd be brilliant. Um, outside of that, I just want to start playing more with, like, uh, I like braggots, <clears throat> so I like doing playing around with those, and I like grit, uh, like that one grit that I made using all the weird things instead of hops for bittering mm -hmm. and all that. And it's, I kind of want to go down that path of just finding really weird things and making yeah. something good out of it. I was like, who would have thought atomic fireballs and ghost chilies would taste good, but it actually does. It, you can't drink much. It sounds like we're on the same path right now. <laughs> but, yeah. So it's just kind of going down that path of wanting to try <clears throat> things other than hops or your standard fruits and cinnamon and stuff like that. Because there's so many things out there with so much flavors in it, in the herbs and. Uh, various other plants and whatnot have you ever <laughs> hopped your blood orange mead before i have not hopped any mead other than a braggots okay think about that if I actually, but yeah <clears throat> so <laughs> i've um it's funny you mentioned the blood orange because recently I, I use i haven't been using um actual blood oranges i mm -hmm. well maybe i have what did i oh it was grapefruits i used that one time anyways um I haven't been able to mainly I it's just hard to get a hold of blood oranges here, I think in a good <clears throat> tasting capacity mm -hmm. around me. So I've yeah. been using like the Amaretti, not necessarily fake product, but it's the yeah. um the extract slash you know, natural flavoring. Um I recently did one that was a blood orange hopped mead and it was pretty mm -hmm. fantastic. Um, yeah, I've had hopped meads before and they're pretty tasty. Mm -hmm. um just haven't haven't made one yeah i uh it's really i feel like we mentioned earlier about the the haziness that you get from hops but also mm -hmm. there's such a big mouth feel you get from adding hops yes adding spices <clears throat> and anything like that that just really um yep. not only imparts flavor but changes that that mouth feel yeah it's uh, so the acids and hops are a big part of that, mm -hmm. which is why they also help with carbonation and keeping heads on beers and stuff like that is because of all the oils and acids and all that, that are in them. So yeah. they do impart some of that similar to how uh, you can take a super sweet mead and add wood to it and the wood imparts tannins which gives it a drier mouth feel and taste than yeah. what it really is so it's, have you done much with oaking and you know I, or barrel aging of, meats i do a lot of wood aging do and you do wood, oak spirals or like chips or cubes or what so uh in so I've done a little bit of oak meads, um, but I do most of my wood stuff with beer and with the beer and the braggots. Um, and it's usually cubes. Uh, for oak, I prefer Hungarian oak because it imparts a cotton candy sweet flavor that I like. Mm -hmm. Plus adding the tannins to keep that sweetness down lower. But I've also been playing around with uh mesquite mm. so i will buy mesquite uh toast it myself to about a medium and use that 
Um, one of the braggots that I did was a rye barley wine mm-hmm. braggot and just like a straight up rye. So like 100% rye grain and mesquite honey aged on toasted mesquite that was soaked in rye whiskey. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah, it was, it didn't last. <laughs> it, it, it was 14% and it did not last. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, and that was actually the first one that I actually carbonated with a keg. Like I got a keg okay. system specifically for carbonating because mm-hmm. most of the stuff doesn't I do is doesn't carbonate because it's really hard to carbonate 10, 12, 14% stuff mm-hmm. like that. So this was actually the first one that I carbonated with that. But I actually did a carbonated grapefruit mead. It was like my third or fourth mead that I ever did. Interesting. Okay. And that actually, uh, that one took about two years before it actually tasted good out of the bottle. It tasted good going into the bottle, but then the yeast analyzed so you had the analyzed yeast off flavor, which is kind of band-aid-y. Mm-hmm. But two years later, that kind of started wearing off. Mm-hmm. So so that's an off flavor that will age out. Just takes yeah. several years. So, so. I, uh, in my my process, of course, learning about things I've, uh, about mead, w- one of my main sources for learning about a lot of the science of mead was actually your channel. And you <laughs> kind of introduced me to the world of um, fusels. And what mm-hmm. they are, and kind of like what they what they mean for a mead, yeah. And it, which I thought was fascinating at the time. At this at this point with my mead making career, I'm I, I feel like I'm just a mead scientist more than I am like a mead creator. I'm just like doing so much uh-huh. stuff that's like, what can <clears throat> yeah. I do to test the mead science? But yep. fusels are fascinating to mm-hmm. me. What can you speak to? You, you just said that um, the analyzed yeast side wears off over time. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed when you've experienced any fusils? Are there any, um, I guess it's hard to know exactly what fusils there are, but most of the time, do you feel like those flavors go away over time or are they sticking around for (laughs) quite some time? So I actually have a very sensitive palate to fusils. So I detect them very quickly. Um, one of the ones that I de- detect very quickly is uh, fermenting too hot or stressed yeast. So I was like, instantly, it's like, okay, this was fermented too hot. And it's like, when I'm judging or whatever, it's like, I can taste that like right away. And people are like, how did you know that? I was like, I taste it. There's the mm-hmm. fusils that you get from fermenting too hot. So do you feel so, like you got that from experiencing it? from doing it and like you, maybe you fermented something too hot and you went, Oh, this is what this tastes like. Or was like, Oh, def- definitely. It's like, otherwise I would have no idea what, what it is it's like this. This doesn't taste right. And I don't know why it's like, I had a mead that I fermented and I know it was for a minute too hot. It was like, it was very, very strong. And it was like later it's like, I had one that was fermented, not quite as hot, but still too hot. It was like, not quite as strong as like, okay, this is, kind of what that is. Um, I also took a BJCP uh, testing class and mm-hmm. we actually went through a lot of the off flavors and stuff. <clears throat> and that was like, one of the things like instantly is like, oh, this is nasty. It's for a minute too hot. And he was like, very few people actually understand that. It was like, meanwhile, it's like, there was a bunch of other stuff is like, yeah, I can't taste this one. I can't taste this one type thing. So it's like, everybody has a sensitive palate to different things. And mine just happens to be strained yeast. Well, I mean, that's a very valuable <laughs> like skill to have. I mean, yeah. If you're making it definitely, but it's like, if you're trying to enjoy somebody else's and they do well, nothing. I, for soul, diagnosing but, though, you know, I think yeah. that it's definitely helpful to say, Hey, oh, I feel definitely. like I'm getting this from it. Yeah. So, but yeah, it just, so some of it does age out. Some of it doesn't. Um, the fermented too hot. I haven't 
had a mead old enough yet where it has fully aged out, but I do feel like it steps down a little bit over time. Uh -huh. So I, I do remember some of them being like, holy cow, this is really bad. And it was like five years later, it's like, this is tolerable. Mm -hmm. like, pour, That's pour, pour it over ice and it'll be all right. Cause chilling it down dulls your taste buds. So you can't really taste it. Right. Man, one thing that really fascinates me about I mean, mead and wine in general is that um, it does like the the flavor change from you know six months to seven years later. Just for comparison, is oh, yeah. so different. Oh yeah, <clears throat> it was. Uh, so when I first got into making mead, it was my goal to make a mead that was good for twenty five years. Okay. Yeah. So <clears throat> I have yet to actually accomplish that. A lot of the stuff hasn't lasted that long or hasn't tasted good enough to last that long. Um, but it hasn't I've, tasted good enough yet. <laughs> I mean, yeah. just keep holding on. You never know. <laughs> it's like I do have the first test of the 25 one <clears throat> still going. And uh, I want to say it's about five or six years. And it is okay. It's is that in a better. carboy or is that in a bottle right now? I, I So in 2018, when I was having a bunch of life issues, I bottled everything. So I got nothing left mm -hmm. in carboy. So otherwise, it would still be in a carboy. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> but going through it, it was like I learned about what it took to make something that could age. And it was high alcohol, high sweetness, and high um the pigments and stuff so the darker it is the better it'll age so the alcohol the better it age the higher the sugar the better it'll age so i made a sack buckwheat mead okay yeah so so it's super dark um super sweet and super buckwheat that's <laughs> Oh, yeah. Of course, the the issue with buckwheat is it also greatly depends on whether you get East Coast or West Coast buckwheat. Yeah, I was gonna There's, say I'm actually I have buckwheat honey right now that I've been experimenting with, <clears throat> and it's it's good, but it is such a flavorful. It's so powerful. It's got yeah. some. It's it's like very unique. It's very um, obviously buckwheat is the name, but like to me, I feel like I'm chewing on some hay. Like yep. when yep. I, it's very sweet hay when I try it. Yeah. Um, so that sounds like it's also, it kind of has like an earthy tone mm -hmm. to it. Yeah. Very molasses, so that, very, yeah. Yeah. So that is West Coast. Buckwheat. Okay. So East Coast, we go back to medicinal. Mm -hmm. The honey itself has a medicinal flavor. You ferment with it and it brings out those medicinal flavors. So that would not be a good mead to try and age with that particular honey. So it's, you, you also have to kind of pay attention to the honey profiles as well. Yeah. Well, it's, and it's, it's weird funny. that it's the same plant, but different flavors from different sides of the continent. Yeah. Yeah, honey, I, I've tried a bunch of different honeys at this point, and my favorites are like mesquite. Um, mm -hmm. Buckwheat is, is up there, but it's not very high up there. I like buckwheat um, in tea. Oh yeah, I haven't tried yeah. that yet. Yeah, it's it like I, good. I, yeah, I grew up drinking tea, and I'd use buckwheat honey in my tea, and huh. it's just like putting molasses in some Earl Grey, and it's like, yeah, it's really good. Yeah, I'll have to try that. I have, I mean, I have like thirty pounds of it, so I gotta find some use <laughs> for it <laughs> uh -huh. at this point. But no, honey, I, I think that as I've experienced more honey, um, obviously we all start and we maybe start with a clover or a wildflower and that's not a bad place to start, but no. there are definitely, like you're saying, some really valuable characteristics you can get out of specific honeys and high quality honey. Yeah. And that goes back to like the first Canadian Sasquatch mead challenge where it was traditional, just honey, yeast, nutrients, water done. And I wanted to do that because I wanted to see more of the whole honey flavors and all that. So like, yeah, I 
found cranberry honey. So it was just honey made from cranberry flowers. Mm -hmm. And it had that tart cranberry flavor in it. And the mead had that tart cranberry flavor in it, but there was no anything in it. Yeah. And it comes back to uh, this guy that I know I've met him at a bar who he does his own brewing and all that. And he stopped going to, uh put into competitions and stuff uh, many 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 years ago because he did a traditional mead with blueberry honey so just honey made with blueberry flavors and he got dinged because they didn't think it was just honey they thought that he actually put blueberries in it so yeah it's like all right so we need to start paying more attention to what honey actually imparts in because it is for the most part the second biggest ingredient in what we're making yeah for sure i have you ever tried avocado blossom honey i have not it has been on my list i've got like a list of ones that i really want to try there's avocado there's uh uh heather there's uh oh the one that tastes like marshmallow Oh, the uh, meadow foam. That one meadow I want to try too. <clears throat> oh wait, no, I just recently tried meadow foam. I haven't tried brewing with it, but I actually did. A friend of mine had a little tub of it, and so we tried some of it. I was like, "Yeah, marshmallow." Did it really? Okay, yeah, I was gonna say. Yeah, I wonder. I've so, never tried it, so I wonder if it does taste well, like marshmallow. Yeah, no, I remember that now. But yeah, so it's so there's a bunch of honeys out there that I really want to try. Um, another honey that I wanted to try was. A South American killer bee honey. <laughs> Man, so, sorry, core. <laughs> yeah, it was supposed to have very strong caramel, again, like similar to the wildflower one that I just made my bouchette out of. But this this one, it was supposedly like biting into like a caramel bar or something like that. Wow. That kind of flavor. Yeah. And I was like, I want to try that. And it was like, trying to get some of that i was like yeah sold out sold out sold out <laughs> it's some of these are so hard to get and they get to be so expensive too i'm oh yeah <clears throat> was, I, I found it's like sometimes you can wheel and deal at the local farmer's market but sometimes you can also just get a five gallon bucket for a lot cheaper online yeah, oh yeah with the shipping so here in oklahoma i've yet to find one that's gotta, cheap i'm i'm the last time I asked my local apiary was probably six months ago, a year ago. And he was like, yeah, it'll be like three fifty for a five gallon pail. And I was like, hold on. I can't, Ooh. I can't do that. <clears throat> yeah. I think it was $220 for my five gallon shipping included. Yeah. See, uh, where were you getting that? But if I, I don't mind asking, if you mind answering. Uh, I don't remember. There's like one. Dutch gold I know of. There's a thing called Webstaurant. There's, um, I'm sure there's some other ones in the yeah, world. Yeah, there's, there's quite a few of them out there. I, I don't remember. Yeah. Well, and I don't think really online honey is bad. bad. I definitely think we have to watch <clears throat> if it's pasteurized and filtered. That's where we get into yes. those those question marks. And I, I, this sounds weird, but I was not, I believed that there's a difference between unfiltered and pasteurized honey but I didn't experience until I ordered some orange blossom from um, a company called Webstaurant and they do a ton mm. of restaurant things and mm. um, it is filtered and um, pasteurized. Seeing my meads four months in with that honey, I'm like, okay, yeah, I can taste the difference between, mm -hmm. especially in like mouthfeel and yeah. actual character presence. Yeah. So pasteurized, they're going to, either be heating the honey up so you're losing a lot of the flavors and aromas right there or they're adding chemicals to it which mm -hmm. is adding different flavors to it or mouthfeels or whatever so yeah you definitely want to just go with a straight up raw give me the bits of bugs in it and everything yeah and i think that for anyone listening like it's important to to make mead and try making mead and if that means you have to start with your uh you might have to start with some filtered honey of some sort to just get going. That's fine. But ultimately you should be trying to make a product that is unfiltered. I think a lot of people view mm -hmm. 
mead making like they, they don't jump in the mead making <laughs> because we have so many rules to start like uh, and so with my mead methodology series when i make ancient or joe's ancient orange i use store brand honey mm -hmm. just so i can show you just go to the store you buy honey as long as it's not from china because they cheat with their honey <clears throat> um you're all right you can make decent mead is it yeah. the best mead no but it will be tasty you'll enjoy it it doesn't you don't have to jump right into the 300 dollar mead for whatever yeah there's i think that's that i've noticed that in a lot of my world people always ask like what should, honey should i buy and you know all these all these mm -hmm. things that are basically just a bunch of rules and stipulations to be a mead maker in reality mm -hmm. we should just be saying go buy some honey go buy some water some yeast and throw it together yeah. and see go what to, it tastes go your, like go to your grocery store buy a gallon of water bread yeast raisin cinnamon stick and an orange done yeah all and just like stop go. shopping right there eight yeah. months you'll have a very tasty product absolutely i'm i'm all for I, I think the um and you've been in this community longer than me um but i feel like mm -hmm. the world of mead is is really small right now especially in commercial <clears throat> stores we don't have a lot of available at least around me a lot of available mm -hmm. meads to buy uh, it's and, it's yeah. starting to grow uh, over the mm -hmm. last couple of years <clears throat> like when I was kind of started slowing down on the videos, I was doing the Thirsty Thursdays where I was doing the various commercial needs. And I was like, it's growing. There's more and more out there. It's very slow because people are either stuck in either wine or beer and they don't understand how to drink mead or how to enjoy it. Or um, There's a couple around here in the Houston area that are doing a fantastic job and they're canning it you buy a six pack of their mead it's carbonated it's low abv is like i think their highest one is about six and a half seven percent mm -hmm. lots of different flavors and stuff and so it is growing in place it's just it is where craft beer was like 20 years ago type thing so give it 20 years and there'll be a meadery on every corner. Yeah. And I'm excited for those times. I so, think that our compromise right now that I'm seeing with people starting meaderies is that a lot of people are doing the kind of what you're saying, the, which is not bad, canned, normally low ABV, very close to cider esque mead, which is, it's still mead because it's honey based mm -hmm. product. Um, yeah. And I would love yeah. to see more people take the approach of, maybe shrams or uh, I'm thinking specifically of like moonlight metery. Um, what's the other mm -hmm. one I'm thinking of that are like more high ABV. Wine like. Yeah. Full body things. Yeah. Yep. I think that's one of the issues as well as a lot of people see meat as kind of right there in between of beer and wine. So it's again, it's like not really knowing. I was like, how do, how when do i drink this stuff rather than just like <clears throat> you've, you've got the ones that are doing the low abv can stuff but you also have wineries that are now canning their wine so there's that trying to come back down and then you've got like the higher end meads like the moonlight and the shrams and all that that are making the higher end ones and it's like well it's mead i shouldn't be paying like 20 dollars, 20 30 40 dollars <clears throat> for a bottle of it it's like okay but you're okay paying 100 dollars for a bottle of wine it's yeah actually kind of harder to make mead than wine <laughs> exactly yeah no i uh it's funny to me one so, of the most common questions i get when i give a bottle of mead to somebody is like should i drink this cold and it's like not a dumb question but it's just yeah. like a, a testament to like people don't know anything about mead yeah in the regard that you know wine you can you can drink chilled. You can drink, you know, room temp. With, yeah, with with wines, it's usually whites are cold, reds are room temperature. Yeah, so it's so, like people are just figuring out what the what it actually 
is like to drink a mead. Yeah. But I'm afraid that we're going to get to the point where meads are categorized as this seven, six and a half to seven percent ABV thing that's a uh, hydromels essentially that are mm-hmm. pineapple and mango and strawberry flavored yeah. ciders. <clears throat> yeah. That that is that can be a thing, but I think there's also like the uh, companies that I'm thinking of, I can't remember their names off the top of my head, but they also do like the proper bottled like wine meads and stuff like that. <clears throat> yeah, those it's like their canned meads are really, really good. Uh, Meridian Hive, that's one of the yeah. ones that we really enjoy. Um, but they also, so they do the can, they're carbonated and all that, but they also do the higher ABV bottle, enjoy it slowly, whatever type thing. So, so they are doing both of it is like, here's, here's the entry mead. Here's, here's like, I don't know, uh, your IPA, your blonde ale, your pale ale mead, but here's our big stout or barley wine type thing going to a <clears throat> to a beer reference there yeah i've actually got some meridian hive i'm um i'm gonna taste test and i've got some of their canned stuff they're simple you know lemon i think one's like a rose and some <clears throat> other stuff and then i've also the, got the, their the lemon is really good oh really okay i haven't seen yeah. i haven't tried it yet um and then i have one of their bottles of like their I, i'm gonna call it true mead because i feel like it's it's fuller body closer to what we want to hopefully be as mead makers mm-hmm. um i'm excited to try those yeah. for sure we get really good yeah it is yeah meridian i've never had a bad one from meridian hive the only problem for me is so, that i of course i have to have everything shipped here because it's oklahoma yeah. um i just don't have any meads around me so um but it's just you know you're paying for shipping at that point and not that it's yeah. not good to do that but for me, it'd be hard to pay for forty bucks worth of shipping for a yeah. floor pack of whatever. <laughs> so yeah, it can be painful. Yeah, yeah. So maybe one day Oklahoma will um, have some greater options, but we're we're growing. Hey, some, look at right? all the stuff behind you. You should start opening something, dude. I would love to. It'd be <laughs> it'd be amazing. Um, <clears throat> one of my goals in life was is definitely to take what I'm doing now and to grow and, and make it at a um, make it a part of Oklahoma city or wherever I'm at. Uh, but as a teacher, I have a hard time leaving that scene because, you know, I love, I love my students. Um, right. So I'd love to find an element of not only making me, but then finding a place where I can also teach people how to brew. So that'd be right. cool to do that at some point. Join so the who knows? Own program. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, who knows? Maybe we'll see what happens uh-huh. in the future, but it'd be, it'd be a lot of fun. So, is there anything, uh, and I know I've taken a lot of your time, so I want to I close with one thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and this, I don't think this is by any means the last time we'll talk, but I would love to know, uh, what's one thing you want to say to possibly encourage new brewers? And that could be in the world of, you know, mead, maybe wine, beer, anything like that. What's one thing uh, you want to say to to encourage brewers to get started? Don't be afraid. Just do it. It's like, yeah, there is a lot of knowledge out there, but when it comes right down to it, it is a simple process of yeast eating sugar and you have something to drink in the end. So don't be afraid of it. Just jump in and get after it yeah i agree i think it's and you never you never know until you you try it and then yeah your first brew might end up terrible but that's okay because your second brew you learn from your first one exactly so it's like you just keep getting better and better practice uh makes better yeah (laughs) yeah 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 um that's great i love that that's awesome well i appreciate your time and uh of course i'm going to be plugging steve's channel down below if uh, if you want to watch some of his videos, I know that while he's not doing a bunch of stuff, video stuff now, um, he's got a whole archive of a ton of things he's done, including his book, which is, of course, in the description and the video series that you were talking about. 
um, I believe it's probably somewhere in your channel, right? Yeah, there's there should be a playlist as well for that. Yeah. So go and you know check his stuff out, and uh, thanks, Steve, for taking the time. I know that I, I took yeah. up your Friday night, so uh, you can be okay. hanging out with your wife and watching watching TV or doing something uh, more fun than this, but I appreciate you. Yeah, no problem. It's been a pleasure. And like I said, I don't think that was the last time we'll talk, so uh, I, I hope hopefully we'll get to do this again in the future. Well, yeah, I, I would enjoy that. Cool. Hey, well, I appreciate your time. Thanks, man. All right. Thank you.